So we now move on to the final session, which I know everybody's been waiting for. It's amazing to see the tables at the back still full, everybody's still here, everybody's still energized. Lunch will be served um, straight after this incredible session. So we, I'm not a big fan of awards generally. Um, I'm not always sure about the awards sort of process, but what we decided to do, because Atto Germa had shown so much faith in Aviadev was two, three years ago, so on the second um, Aviadev event, I actually interviewed him on stage and we, I presented him with a Lifetime Achievement Award for his efforts in driving forward route development in Africa. And then I thought, well, what would be nice after that is to then have that award named in his honor. So, and uh, last year, um, Rafael Cucci was the recipient and Germa was able to interview him. Now, the process of how this is decided is I have an incredible advisory board and we put in nominations and we vote. So it's not a public vote, it's within the industry, within our, our, our um, advisory board. But there was a name this year that came out very strongly. Um, and basically what I thought as well, I had the inspiration, I'm sure you all watched Tiger Woods win the Masters Golf. And of course the tradition at the Masters is that the previous winner puts the jacket on the new winner, on the incumbent winner. And as Atto Gurma, was unfortunately unable to make it, rather than me do the interview, I thought, let's have Raphael one-on-one -on -one with Chris. So I'd like to invite them to the stage, and just before Raphael starts, we do have somebody who wants to say something as well. So maybe we'll play that while um, they're walking up to the stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I knew Chris uh, since 2004. And uh, when I first met him, he was still the chief executive officer of the uh, uh, Airline Association of Southern Africa. He must be the longest serving CEOs uh, for African aviation. Chris has led the airline uh, of Southern Africa for nearly two decades and has made it the strongest airline regional association in Africa. Prior to that, Chris was a senior member of uh, South African Airways. So Chris is an engineer, a civil engineer, who turned out to be a good airline uh, leader. I'm therefore happy to congratulate Chris for this award, which more than anything else, is our way of saying thank you, Chris, for the service that you send, you, you rendered to Africa, to African aviation. And by awarding Chris today, we are talking to the next, we are telling the, the next generation to follow his example for the sake of African aviation. Chris, you really deserved this award. I'm sorry I could not be in beautiful Cape Town to, to congratulate you in person. Please accept my apologies for the last minute change, but I believe you are one of us and you know you cannot always be where you want to be when duty calls somewhere else. Thank you again, Aviadeb, for organizing this event and for awarding the man who deserves this award at this time. Thank you very much. So then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience with us, Chris. Uh, I think congratulations, first of all. Thank you very much. Uh, Ato Grima said it all. Uh, you have been a long-standing member of this league, and you have distinctively uh, served this industry uh, for a long time. But I think for most of the people in this room, they probably 
might want to know a bit more about you outside of just the aviation industry. So, um, first and foremost, I have observed over the years that uh, we have worked together that oftentimes you are being called or introduced as Christ. And whenever people try to pronounce your surname, I get all sort of versions of your surname being pronounced, depending on who your primary school English teacher was. <laughs> so, before we get into it, I would want you to tell us, how is your surname pronounced, so that we know it from here? Thank you. All right. No, thank you very much. It was an absolute pri privilege to be here, and thank you to John and to Atta Gimmer as well. Um, my name is, in, in, sp pronounced correctly, it's Zweigenthal, because my father was born in Vienna in Austria. And in fact, the, um, I know that the origins go back to Czechoslovakia in the, in the old Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So Zweigenthal, it's been cannibalized as Zweigenthal or Zweigenthal or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so, and if I was worried about the pronunciation, I probably <laughs> wouldn't be sane anymore. But uh, he came, my father came out to South Africa in 1936, when, just before the war, after the uh, Nazis came to power. And uh, fortunately, he got out because there are not many of, that, of our family left in, in Europe. At the, anymore. So that's, that's the history and married to South African and here I am. Ah, great. So now, ladies and gentlemen, you got it. <laughs> Even though I will not try to pronounce it to you. <laughs> but make sure you always add his surname so that he, we, can, we can know him properly because oftentimes I hear Chris of Asa. <laughs> Chris of Asa seems to be the, the most that's popular right. name. So, so Chris, if we can step back a little bit. Can you tell us about yourself? What do you think we probably don't know about Chris, the aviation man? Okay, I think uh, from a personal perspective, um, let me just start off by saying my faith in God is, is, is very important to me, and I base a lot of my work and my actions on, on that. I generally um, believe in the goodness of people, and um, I'm driven by people and by relationships. Um, I have a huge passion for the industry and I, I often probably um, like to take responsibility for lots of different things and lots of different actions because in seeing the big picture, I think there are things that have to be done and why we need to perform the tasks that we do and a lot of work that we need to do. Um, from a personal life perspective, I've been absolutely blessed to be married to the most wonderful wife uh, for 35 years. And I have two children and three grandchildren. Um, and the great thing about this is that we're all friends and we enjoy being in each other's company and going on holidays together. We've never had that situation where they never wanted to be with us and things like that. And I think it's, it's also now being even more cemented with the grandchildren here. So that's where I'm on that side. Oh, thank you. So, so how did you get into aviation? Was it by accident, as is the case with most of us, or it was just a deliberate effort to get in there? I uh, graduated as a civil engineer. I worked in the construction industry for, on, on the, in Transnet for 10 years. And um, towards the end of the 80s, um, a lot of the work sort of dried up, and there was an opportunity to um, apply for a position in South African Airways. And I took that opportunity to apply, and I was fortunate to get the position and I, I think that was the, uh, the, the, the catapult, the, catapult well, the, 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 the thing, that, the mechanism that catapulted me into aviation. And um, it was very different, obviously, from aviation, although some of the issues related to working with contract and legal um, contracts and, and, and aspects like that um, were very, uh, you know, equipped me to, to move in there. So I moved into a very commercial field. I, I, my first job was, um, buying jet fuel for South African Airways, so jet fuel procurement officer. And after two years, I moved into flight operations, where I probably think was the biggest learning curve working with pilots and, uh, and to understand them. I was the non-flying part of the flight operations. So I have always indebted to, to the colleagues that I had um, in that area for teaching me about what it meant to do an operation, fly an, op an airline, and to, and to operate and to do things. And, and then I moved into the marketing department um, and worked a lot on the aeropolitical side, regulatory side, distribution, etc. Also, some aspects of sales. 
And then in 1998, I was asked to go to Kampala by the then CEO uh, to run Alliance Air. Many of you would probably know it, uh, based in, in, in uh, Uganda. And um, obviously, unfortunately, that operation had to cease, um, cease operations, and I came back to South African Airways, where I worked for a year um, with in heading up global passenger services, and then joined, uh, left them at the end of 2001 and joined um, ours in 2002 was Deputy CEO to, uh, to John Morris, and many of you would know, until two, March 2009, and then I became the CEO. I've been there since then. Wow. Thanks. And, and you're still going? I'm still going. A passion of this industry, as you know, and many of us sitting here, it's, uh, you can't get it out of your blood once you're in. Once it's in. <laughs> How true is it that the moment you breathe the, 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 the scent emanating from aviation fuel, you never are able to stay away from this industry. Well, I think, <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. And my, as I said, my first job was buying jet fuel, so I probably got a heck of a waffle, all the fumes into me, and that never, that's never left me. <laughs> so for the young, the young folks aspiring to join this industry, this is to what extent is contagious. <laughs> you get in there and you want to leave, but you cannot leave. So just know that it's a, 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 an industry that requires a lot of commitment and dedication. And once you get in, you're stuck in there. That's right. <laughs> so, so Chris, tell us, now, what would you consider to be your proudest moments in this industry? Well, I think um, probably today is pretty special, for one. And I really appreciate the, the honor. And secondly, um, I think going back to my first profession, which was civil engineering, getting my professional engineering status, um, was, was very important to me at that stage. It was it also um, enabled me to, to move up in the organization. But one of the other things, maybe to take it back to a more personal and, and a social level, is that I'm, I was very privileged to work with a lot of team members and maybe to bring some team members into, my, into the organization, particularly South African Airways at the time, um, and to actually watch them achieve huge success and went on to many of them to, um, to do occupy very senior positions in, in, the, in the airlines and even some as CEO. And that was really um, something that was for me was very important. So I think that's, uh, those are proud moments to see that some of the work and being, being recognized by others and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Great, thanks. Now, uh, let, me, let me switch it the opposite direction. So mm -hmm. what would you consider to be the biggest challenge or biggest hurdle that you have actually met uh, in this industry? Yeah, I think from a challenge perspective, I think my time at Alliance Air was probably the biggest hurdle uh, and biggest challenge. Um, I think the concept, as we many, uh, many of us have been involved with multinational airlines, it was a multinational airline that was set up. And it should have, I think as many of us will, will know from other, other examples in, in, the, in Africa, it should have worked and it would have, I think, it provided a huge opportunity but unfortunately, it was another case where business and politics didn't mix. And as a result of that, there was a breakdown in, in, um, in, in, in communication between the, and relationship between the shareholders, and ultimately the airline itself had to stop operations. It was the worst, the, the most difficult thing was obviously the impact on the management and the staff of that airline. I'll never forget that uh, day when we had to stop operations. No, oh, great. Since yesterday, we have been discussing about challenges in this industry, uh, the opportunities, and everything in between. If you were to look at the top three challenges in this industry, what would you say they are, in your opinion? I think one of the, the aspects that we need to do um, is, at the moment, airlines in the, in the majority are struggling and fighting for survival. They're in some form of turnaround, um, and I, th I think that one of the aspects I would like to suggest is that from a um, challenge perspective that we need to, there's a lack of vision and there's a lack of strategic intent, probably from a state perspective as well as from an airline perspective. And we need to find some way to develop, uh, that the, the airlines need to, and the states need to collectively develop that. And so one of the problems is the, the lack of alignment of vision within the states to be able to support the industry. We've, we've spoken many times. I'll never forget um, about seven or eight years ago listening to James Hogan when he'd just taken over and started up um, Etihad. 
and he said that one of the reasons for success, I think he said he made Etihad profitable in, eight, in six years, was because the entire Team USA Abu Dhabi, probably, um, was actually aligned with the, 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 the necessity of ensuring that transport, tourism, trade, foreign affairs, um, and all other government departments are totally aligned with making this a success. Um, and, and, and so I think the political will and the necessity to ensure that you get resolved differences is, is, is a big aspect. I think another aspect, there are many obviously challenges, but I think the other aspect is, which has been referred to many times is, is to enable and resolve the ability to have free movement of passengers and trade amongst Africa. We've spoken about visas, we've talked about the free trade area, it's time to put our money where our mouth is and, and get a change of, almost a change of, of mindset, I think is required to actually solve this particular problem and, and to stop um, messing around to try and make um, everybody happy, but actually you're not making everybody happy. Yeah. So, so, so as earlier, the, the, there was a panel discussion here where the, the, we had some commercial directors of the airlines and I asked them the question, why are they not working with each other? And they, they sort of fumbled over the question and got up and left. So I want to put it to you as, as the head of the Airline Association of Southern Africa. What is keeping our airlines away from working with each other? Yeah, it, what I say is probably, I probably would say is probably quite controversial. Um, I think there's a lot of inter-airline, well, the wrong word is, I'm gonna use the word envy, maybe jealousy, about success of, of others and the ability and, and the the feeling that you want to be able to do it all on your own. Yeah, I must be able to say that I make an airline, my airline, strong and successful and I did it on my own. I didn't need my friends. And I think what we've heard today in many aspects that you've mentioned and many of the, of the panelists have said is that uh, you need partnerships, you need colleagues. We are, airlines in Africa are far readier, more ready I should say, to engage with international airlines and put partnerships together, probably because of the international feed, than they are to work with their neighbors. And I think we've got to find a way to, in, um, to promote and in, in, in ensure there's greater cooperation between, between the airlines. There's, there's no reason why it shouldn't be, so, yeah. But what would you consider the, 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 the most opportunity, what, what are the best opportunities that you think African airlines can take advantage of, if, if you were just to mention three of them? Well, I think um, a huge aspect is that there's no doubt that out of those challenges that we spoke about, um, and going some of the other challenges that you would also look at is to try and deal with the issues of, of taxes and charges and um, in obviously maintaining focus on safety and security and, and the skills development that our future leaders mentioned, which was, was and, and, and rising and technology. We've got to actually take that as an opportunity um, for actual growth and development to put African aviation on the global stage. Um, and I think that we've got, if we, if, we, if we work on those, all those aspects individually and then collectively, there's a huge possibility for growth because I think that um, all the studies show that African aviation will grow probably the highest growth, second highest growth um, after Asia. Um, and is in Africa, but it's still a single-digit growth. We're still talking about, on average, four, five percent for for the next 20 years. And quite honestly, from a low base where we have got a very low market share of just two to two and a half percent of global population, we must be able to get into a situation where we um, get to a double-digit growth. I think I mentioned it yesterday as well. So. There's the opportunity of growth is, is significant and, and, and the double and doubling of that is, um, of doubling it up to, to double digit growth must be a solution and there's no reason why we can't. Excellent. So now we have got a very large aging population, particularly professionals in the aviation industry, engineers and pilots. ICAO indicates over 60% of the engineers in our airlines today should be 
going on retirement in the next five years or so, between now and the next five years. But if you look at it increasingly, whilst we have very aging engineers, we are not seeing a lot of the young engineers in the system to replace these ones. How do you think we can fast track the pace of actually integrating the youth into the industry? Yeah, I think um, very importantly, I think initially one's really got to start at grassroots, um, go back to school. Um, I've said that in the previous conference as well. Um, we're, we're grassroots identifying, exposing um, young people to, to aviation, getting their interest in that aspect and, um, and, and, and nurturing that, that interest and getting it up to a point where uh, from a from, a, from a, 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 a secondary and tertiary school, you're preparing them for those, for those, in, for those, uh, for those professions. There's such a, an, an opportunity for, um, for young people to get into the industry, and you're absolutely right. One of the other aspects is these older folks, like myself, have got to get into the business of mentoring and coaching and showing an interest in, in new population. There's a it's an incredible that there are some new, people, new youngsters coming into the population, but there was, uh, there's a gap between, say, the 25 and 35-year-olds up to the... F and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap between 35 and 45, 47-year-old where people, there's not, there, um, there's, not, there's not enough people. So you're having the older folk go on, on retirement, but the, the, the younger people are very capable. They're the millennials. They are, they've got all the new ideas, but they, they need to create that experience to be able to get into and be put into, into, into positions of, of, of authority so that they don't fail. So I think start that, and there are many programs that are, are going around which are fantastic around um, Africa. So uh, probably my second but last question, how would Chris want to be remembered one day when you eventually <laughs> bow out of this industry? I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of my biggest emphasis is on, is on cultivating business relationships. Um, I know that um, with some of the challenges I faced in the past, if I did not cultivate and did not burn bridges, because I think burning bridges is one of the worst things you can actually do. If, if, I, if I did not um, just deal with, my, with setbacks in my, in my life uh, in, a, in a mature and proper way, I probably wouldn't have had the opportunities I have to get today. So I really hope that um, from that perspective, that, um, that we get the opportunity for mentorship, um, which and I would really like to be able to have the, the ability to know that I'm happy to pass on experience and, and knowledge to, to those that follow. Um, and I've had, it'd be very fortunate to have some amazing people that have spoken into my life uh, from my earliest days until now. And as I say, I still learn every single day. Um, I really like to think that I have worked on behalf of the industry. I've worked hard and taken responsibility to make a difference in terms of finding and making solutions for the industry. Um, I'm just on a, on a lighter note, also to join yourself and all the, those that are working on, on SATAM and the Agenda 2063 to, uh, to see if we can get a realization of those goals. I worked out that in 2063 I'll be 105 years old, so maybe I could invite it to the, to the final signing ceremony. <laughs> Thanks. Finally, finally, Chris, yeah. look at this audience and then give them your final word. What would you want to leave with them so that as they go, they remember you? Thank you. <laughs> look, there's, this is not, has not been a one-person one journey. Um, it's been um, an incredible journey, and that's why it was, when I was, I, have, I had just have, had so many highlights, and it's been an absolute privilege to work in every sphere of this industry, uh, starting with my... Um, my team, I was a team both past and present, those that have, be, have been there when I started and those that have left. Um, all the airlines and the associate members who have given us incredible support, um, industry associations, um, organizations, from the CEO to the management and the teams that have, have worked very closely together. We can't, we know as, as industry associates, we can't do everything on our own. Um, so in this context, it's been an incredible team operation. Really like to also appreciate the industry partners, service providers, who have also played such a big role, and also very importantly, our government organisations, political principals that we've had the privilege of working with, ministers, government officials, um, state-owned enterprises, 
all of private companies, public and pri private partnerships, and then also, lastly, not least, my, the support of my family, who has actually given me amazing support. Um, when I, I spoke to my wife about this, she said, you know that you actually probably spend 80% of your time in business, in your business, but I hope that um, I've been able, and I think I have been able to give them the support that they require when they've needed it. I've learned and continue to learn from everybody in this industry, and I really want to thank everybody for the privilege of, of working with you and um, wishing you all well. Um, I'm truly honored by this um, award, and thank you, John, Atagirma, and the committee that did that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you. Appreciate it. So, ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you the 2019 winner of the Ato Grima Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you very Chris. much. Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.